Alhamdulillahirrabbilalameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'la hadrta fillah Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Hayyakum Allah Continuing on with our study of Bulug al-Maram Kitab al-Jami' Bab al-Adab We reach the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Hadith Abi Huraira radiyallahu ta'an which is from a group of hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which deals with the manners <coughs> of how we give salams to one another how we interact with one another and the manners of salam and we talked about in the beginning of our study in Kitab al-Jami' we talked about the importance of the salam and from those hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would show that giving salam is a way of uh, causing us to love one another as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said and that the salam it lightens the heart and it makes a person more open to the message or what you are going to convey to them, they're more receptive uh, f with the salam. And their hearts are more open in general for generally any interaction. And that can even be the case even when people are, uh, when they're angry with you, and so on and so forth, that giving salams to them is a way of softening the hearts in general. And so these group of hadith that we'll study, they will talk about the various Islamic adab with regards to salam. And in the first hadith, <coughs> the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and this is hadith 1242. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, the young should greet with peace the old. The one who is passing by should greet the one who is sitting. And the small group, meaning the small in number, should salute the larger one, Mutafakun Ali, agreed upon in Bukhari and Muslim. And narration by Muslim has, and the one who is riding should greet the one who is walking. In this hadith of the Prophet وسلم, of course it is bayan kafiyat salam. Oh, uh, yeah. So this is a hadith which talks about the how we should uh, give salams to one another, those mannerisms uh, that we should observe, and who takes precedence over whom with regards to the salams. Uh, so in this hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لِيُسَلِّمْ أَصْغِيرُ عَلَى كَبِيرُ The first part of the prophetic mannerisms or the first thing or the first way of giving salams that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in this hadith, he said, it is that the young give salams to the old. And this is uh, very important when we look at in the manner in the in with uh, with regards to adab and manners, because we see that in more contemporary times that people are moving further and further away from caring for the elderly, and this can be in the way of either financially. And it could be with regards to their own relatives. And it could be with regards to respect. And this prophetic guidance, which is contained in this hadith, which is just simply the salams, illustrates how important respecting the elders is, is in Islam. That the elders maintain a great status uh, in Islam, when we are practicing our Islam. And so as I was mentioning, the greater society, 
uh, around the world, Muslim and non-Muslim, you see that the people are moving away from these important mannerisms uh, of taking care of the elderly, respecting the elderly. And in fact, you find that things have gotten so backwards and upside down, especially in many of the Western countries, that you'll find that often you'll find that the people are absolutely disrespectful of the elderly to such an extent that the youth are so lost and so misguided that they expect the elders to give them some sort of great and exalted respect. So they've actually turned the tables. They've actually turned the mannerisms, which are prophetic mannerisms, upside down to where the elderly should respect them. And in fact, in, in our society, in America, it has reached a level to where sometimes you'll find youth, some youth, that are so despicable that they harm the elders, go way beyond disrespecting the elders, even they will kill the elders if they feel that they have disrespected them. So it shows how backward and how upside down people have become. And Islam, as we see, is il as is illustrated in, uh, in the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, he said, And that the young should give salams to the kabir. So that means the youth should give respect to the elders. That's the first adab or manner that's illustrated in this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And then the Prophet mentioned after that, he said, the one who is passing by should greet the one who is sitting. So the Prophet let us know that from those uh, manners, so that when we have no ashkal, we have no uh, confusion uh, 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 regarding these prophetic manners, and that we will be rewarded if we follow the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, is for us to know that the people who are sitting have a greater right over the people walking. Meaning that the people who are walking by, that if someone is walking by a group of Muslims, or they're sitting at the cafe, whatever the case may be, they should greet the people sitting. Assalamu alaikum. They've entered a room, in the, entered a majlis. They should come in and, and say assalamu alaikum to the group. Not that they come and stand at the door and then everyone must give them salams first. No, but the the adab, as we see, as illustrated by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is that the one passing by, those sitting, should give the salam, should give the greeting first. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, and the small group should salute or give salams to the larger group. So if there are a group of people and another group, the smaller group should give uh, salams to the larger uh, group. It, it, that's where the precedence takes place with regards to the salam. And as is mentioned in another narration, in Sahih Muslim, and the one who is sitting, uh, riding, should greet the one who is walking. So if one is, uh, you know, we don't often have the situation, but it depends on the country you're in and what have you, where someone is riding, for example, on a camel or riding on a horse or what have you, greets the one who is sitting. Uh, and likewise, perhaps, or the one who's standing. And perhaps this might be, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, uh, about this qiyas, but perhaps the one who's in the car, who gets out of the car, or who's driving by the car, rolls down his window and says, Salaamu Alaikum to the one who's walking. Okay, so this is what we see as far as the adab in general from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So from the fawa'id, from the be benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it shows us the mashru'iyah of giving salam between people who meet one another. That this is mishroor. This is from Islam. This is the Islamic uh, adab. And this is an amr or a command or an 
or or an, an action which is agreed upon by the ulama, and that this is from, as we mentioned in the hadith, uh, in some of the hadith uh, prior to this, I believe it was one of the first hadith we mentioned about uh, the hadith of the Prophet where he said a Muslim, a uh, uh, Muslim, or haq al Muslim ala Muslim khams. But in the narration, I believe we studied was a haq al Muslim ala Muslim sit. That the right of a Muslim over another Muslim is six. And this was one of the first rights that were mentioned in that hadith showing us that this is an important right. It's a haq that they have over you. So this is a haq that must be uh, fulfilled. It's a right that your brother has over you. And especially under these situations, uh, we see the one we learn from this hadith who gives uh, the word the precedence of the salam, uh, you know, uh, is, you know, who has more right over the other to give salams first. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that we learn that the young in age should give uh, salams to the elders or those older than them. And this is also from prophetic mannerisms, as the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam mentioned. And this shows the respect that the uh, <coughs> that the that Islam gives to the elderly, and that we should never discard that. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala forgive us of our many shortcomings in this and in many affairs of our religion. Amin. Rabbil Alamin. Another benefit of this hadith is that it shows that Islam uh, gives importance to the status and stature of individuals. That we don't just totally discard that. That someone may be a big owner of a company or a big CEO, big businessman or businesswoman. Or they may be a, a leader of the people. Or they may be a, an, an imam or a scholar or someone who has status over another. So Islam uh, does not negate that people have status uh, you know, various different degrees of status and doesn't put everyone in the same uh, situation, but rather Islam gives precedence to those and that's from the manners, mannerisms of Islam to recognize that and to give people their due uh, right and respect in accordance with their status. Not meaning that you belittle and, and, and uh, others who have less status, but rather you recognize those who might have a greater uh, status uh, according to the customs, for example, a chief of a village or a chief of a tribe, then you should respect that in accordance with that tribal order just out of respect. And Islam does not negate that, but rather Islam recognizes that. And we see it through many uh, uh, a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in his da'wah. Uh, another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, and this goes along with what we said, is, is recognizing people's uh, status. And in another hadith, the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam said, Anzilu nasa munazilahu. The Prophet والسلام, said in Abu Dawood in Kitab al Adab, so also in the Book of Manners in uh, Sunan Abi Dawood, uh, he said sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to put people in their, give people their respect in accordance with their status, basically. Put people in their rightful place, if you will. So, therefore, if when you meet a great alam, you should give him uh, a, a great respect, you know, or alima, uh, compared to even just someone who is a sheikh, a pe person of knowledge, or someone who's a student of knowledge, or less than that. That everyone has their due right and respect and how you deal with them and how you, uh, uh, you know, how you relate to them and, in, and giving them their respect and their due rights.
Uh, this also leads uh, to us to understand just the importance in general of respecting those who have, uh, uh, you know, who have a, a greater uh, sense, a, great, a greater status, if you will. Those people who are in high status, and most of those Fawai, uh, they inter interrelate with one another. The hadith narrated by Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when people are passing by, it is enough if one of them offers the greeting of peace on their behalf. And it is enough for those who are sitting if one of them replies, reported by Ahmed and Al-Bayhaqi. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also uh, illustrated for us through prophetic guidance about the adab or manners for greeting uh, one another. And in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, when people are passing by, it is enough if one of them offers the greeting of peace on their behalf, letting us know that it is not necessary to, uh, if you are in a group, for everyone to give salams, but as long as the right in general of the believers has been uh, fulfilled by giving salams from one of you, then that is sufficient for the group. So this shows us how groups of people, how they should give salams. And this also is very related to the last hadith that we just uh, mentioned. So this manner uh, is the adab which is illustrated for the jama'ah, you know, for a group of individuals when they are giving salams. So what we learn from this hadith, some of the fawa'id or benefits of this hadith, is that the scholars, they mention that beginning with the salam is sunnah uh, kifai. And it is not sunnah, sunnah uh, ayn. Which means that beginning the salam, so that means the group that's coming up, and for example, if we have a party of two uh, uh, of Muslims, you know, five here that are walking by and three sitting down, or ten sitting down, doesn't matter the added necessarily, but the ones that are beginning the salams, and we already learned that those standing uh, should give salams to those sitting, so that those people standing, if they come up and just one from amongst them gives salams, then that's sufficient for the whole group. It is not necessary in uh, in beginning the salam. So this means in, in being, <coughs> uh, that it's from the sunnah, the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's sunnah, uh, sunnah to kifai, meaning that it is a sunnah, not an obligation, uh, but that it is, uh, you know, as long as one person from amongst the, uh, the Muslims fulfills that duty, then it removes the sin or it removes the uh, responsibility on the rest of the, uh, the group. Uh, and another benefit of this hadith is that it is also uh, from the sunnah and recommended to for all the individuals to give salams. So we also understand from this hadith that all the individuals uh, should 
give salat. And this is understood from the statement of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, That it is permissible, if you will, uh, for the jama'ah. That it's okay for the whole jama'ah, the whole group to, to do this, meaning to give salams. So from there, we see uh, that uh, that it's also permissible, of course, from the zahir of understanding this hadith, is that uh, to uh, for the uh, that it's from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If everyone does that, they will receive reward by Allah subhanahu wa taala. <clears throat> Another faida or benefit of this hadith is that we learn in general that returning the salam is uh, fard kifaya. That returning the salams is an obligation. So beginning with the salams is, is sunnah, but returning the salams is an obligation and it is uh, fard kifaya. So how could that be? Well, from the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, وَيُجْزِيُ عَلَى الْجَمَاعَةَ أَنْ يُرَدَّ أَحَدُهُمْ And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that it is okay that from the group that if if one of the persons from the group uh, returns the, the the salam, so that lets us know that it's permissible that it's not uh, uh, and and that, that that's sufficient. What we learn from that is that that is sufficient. And also, as Ben Othman he mentions that this is fard. Kifai, that this is an obligation to return the salams, and as long as one person from amongst the jama'ah in that room returns the salams, then that's sufficient. So that gives us an indication that sometimes we, we, for example, you're reading Quran, you're in the masjid, and there's a group of Muslims, some people are reading, some people are praying, some people are just in the masjid, and then someone enters the masjid and they give salams to the congregation in general. That if, as long as someone gives salams back, then that is fulfilling the uh, the right. And that is fulfilling the fard al-kifai, as we mentioned. Because they are re returning the salams, uh, which was given to the group. They are returning the salams. They are lifting the sin from the rest of the group. Meaning if no one gives them salam, no one gives this person salam, then they haven't fulfilled that duty. And when we say something is fard a kifaya, that means it's an obligation. That means it's it's an obligation to fulfill fard al kifaya as long as someone from amongst the Muslims fulfills that, then the sin is removed from the rest. And so that's what it means when we make that hukum fard al kifaya. And that's what Ben Othimini mentions here that this is a, uh, a an obligation. You know, so it's an obligation to return the salams. Those are some of the main uh, benefits we gain from this uh, hadith. In the next hadith, <clears throat> uh, hadith 1244, narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do not initiate greeting Jews and Christians with peace before they greet you. And when you meet one of them on the road, force him to go to its narrowest side. Uh, Muslim reported it. Uh, this hadith also is another hadith. This hadith uh, is, is another hadith which deals with Islamic adab and deals with the adab or the manners of salam as well. And specifically, the, to the topic of this hadith has to do with how to greet Ahl-Kitab, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. 
or, or other disbelievers for that matter. <clears throat> and so what we learn from this hadith of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is he salawatu rabbi wa salamu alayhi said, do not. And so this is from Nahi. This is la and Nahi. This is the prohibition. Do not begin the salams with the Jews and the Christian. And so the scholars, they mention with regards to this that uh, by beginning that the Muslim should not begin the salam. And the salam is specific. This is something specific to Islam. This is not like saying, hi, how are you? Or uh, ahlin wa sahlin in Arabic or something or welcome or something, some other greeting which is not from the Islamic atahia, the Islamic way of greeting. But rather, this is inclusive of the Islamic Salams, Assalamu Alaikum, so that you don't begin your Assalamu Alaikum with uh, non Muslims. And so, what we get, what we learn from this hadith, the benefits of this hadith, first is that it is not uh, permissible for a Muslim, or that it is that a Muslim should be uh, always in a uh, an honorable position and an honorable status that the Muslim should not belittle his or herself that they should uh, should be in a uh, a position of izza, you know a position of honor not humiliated and uh, you know as you know with regards to uh, disbelievers or anyone another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the prohibition of beginning the salam uh, with the Yahud and the Nasara, with the Jews and the Christians, and other than them from uh, the non-Muslims, that the Muslims should not begin with the salam. And as we, we mentioned, the scholars, they mention extensively, and they have some different views, but in general, to sum up, <clears throat> is that it's okay, uh, especially if there's maslaha, to greet with some other greeting, how, uh, hello, how are you, or welcome, or whatever the case may be, that that's okay if you begin your greeting with that. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that if they, what is understood from this hadith is that if they give you salams, then you can give them salams back. So if a non-Muslim says to you, Salamu Alaikum, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, you can say, Wa Alaikum, as is mentioned in a, another hadith. Or what is also understood from this hadith is that uh, it's permissible to say, some of the ulama say this, وَقَالَ بَعْدُ الْعُلَمَا وَهَذَا يَدُلَىٰ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُمْ إِذَا سَلَّمُوا بِسَلَامْ سَرِيحِ فَقَالُوا سَلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ فَلَا حَرَجْ أَنْ نُقُولْ عَلَيْكُمْ سَلَامُ So, that some of the scholars say that if the, uh, you know, Ahli Kitab or, or whoever says, Salaamu Alaikum, you know, in a respectful Salaamu Alaikum, that it is permissible to... Uh, to respond back to them by saying uh, alaykum salam uh, you know that there's no per, there's no harm in that and they deduce this from a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in which he mentioned that if a jew uh, says to you because the jews in the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam some of them used to say to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, they would say sam sam alaykum which means may allah poison you I mean, uh, may you be poisoned. And, uh, or, you know, or, or, or may death or death be upon you. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, you can you respond back to them by saying, wa alaykum, and, and you as well. So some of the ulama from this text, from this nas, have deduced that it's okay what they understand from this, that it's okay that if they give you a proper salam, then you can return it.
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Another benefit of this hadith is that as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in the last part of the hadith that if uh, uh, that if uh, when you meet one of them on the road, force him to go to its narrow side. That here it shows that, uh, as the scholars mentioned, that it's not about harming other communities or harming anyone. But the point here is that it is about the izzah of the Muslim, that the Muslim should maintain and be in an honorable status, that they should be the ones... Uh, you know, illustrating their honor and in control of the situation, if you will, uh, being shown uh, the respect that they deserve for worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So this is what we understand from this, not that you should cause harm and bump people off the road and, 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 and so forth, but especially in the context of the societies in which the Prophet Sallallahu was living, and in fact, much of Islamic history, much of world history, up until more recent times, that communities had a more enmity and more uh, uh, need for asserting themselves. Whereas now, you see that many of the people, and that doesn't mean we're discarding this adab, but you're looking at the masale and the mafasid as well, that this would not work if you were to, to uh, crowd people off the road in America, for example. For one, you would be harmed. It would cause a greater harm to you and other Muslims. It's plain and simple. So it's very important for us to understand these texts and contextualize them and have the understanding, as the ulama mentioned, and that this is primarily a way of showing the izza, the honor, of the Muslim and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. In the next hadith, hadith 1245, <coughs> narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when one of you sneezes, he should say, Alhamdulillah, all praise belongs to Allah. And his brother should say to him, Yarhamakullah, may Allah have mercy on you. When he says this, he should reply, Yahdikumullah wa yuslih balakum, which may, means, may Allah guide you and give you well being. Al Bukhari reported it. In this hadith in Sahih al Bukhari, this affirms for us the hukum that we talked about. Uh, in the beginning in the study of this uh, chapter and it was a hadith about sneezing the adab uh, the Islamic manners the manners of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regards to uh, sneezing and how we should respond to the one who sneezes in this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam some of the uh, benefits that we gain from this hadith is first the mashru'iyya alhamd lillahi and al-atas and this refers to the that is mashru' that it is legislated to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when a person sneezes <clears throat> and this is from the prophetic adab, as we mentioned. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Fal uh, And this is in the Sirat al-Amr. This is a command from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the person who sneezes should say. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this in the imperative form. And the jamhur, or meaning the majority of the ulama, hold that although this is a command in the com command form that this is uh, uh, this is not um, this is sunnah and it is not in obligation uh, and some of the ulama they 
from this, because it's in the imperative form, they say that it is wajib, that it's an obligation. But majority of the ulama say, no, rather it is sunnah. And this, uh, the, the debate regarding the ulama and their arguments is outside of our focus here. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that the atas or the one sneezing or that uh, al atas in and of itself the sneezing is a type of na'mah otherwise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't have legislated this on the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that it is mashru' to to Praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this uh, when one sneezes. <clears throat> and another benefit of this hadith is we also learn from this hadith that when a non Muslim sneezes, that you do not say, uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, Yarhamakullah. And this is the mafhum of the hadith, the understanding of the hadith, because the Prophet wasallam said, فَلْيَقُولُهُ أَخُوهُ That his brother should say to him. And because brother, or this brotherhood is mentioned, that this brotherhood is in reference to those who are on Deen al-Islam, that are Muslims. So this brotherhood that is referred to, as some of the scholars mention, that this is in reference to the Ikhwa Imaniyah, the Islamic brotherhood, Akhwata Imaniyah, and that these are Islamic rights that uh, we have over one another, that we should say, uh, Yarhamakullah. However, Ben Othimin mentions some benefit in regards to this. He says that if a disbeliever sneezes and they say, uh, and they praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we can say, uh, we can supplicate for their guidance, you know, and say, Hadak Allah, you know, may Allah guide you, or something similar to this. Another benefit of this hadith is that it is an obligation for the one who hears the person sneezing, and we talked about this prior, and who hears the person sneezing and they say, Alhamdulillah. So it's Muqayyid, or it's restricted to when they say Al, uh, uh, Alhamdulillah, then we respond by saying Yarhamakallah. So it is an obligation to respond with that Yarhamakallah. Uh, and some of the scholars they mention with uh, regards to this, so the scholars have two. Uh, two views with regards to this. Some they say that it's uh, far of the kifaya, and some say that it is far of the ain to respond back to the person who says that alhamdulillah. Meaning that a group of the scholars say that when a person sneezes and they say alhamdulillah, and a person responds back to them, this is an obligation. Their response uh, is in accordance with. Uh, their responding is in accordance with two different views by the ulama. One of the group, one group of the ulama, say that if the person says, uh, you know, if one person says yarhamakallah, then this is sufficient. This suffices for the group in the room. For example, if there's five people in the room, one person sneezes and says alhamdulillah. The other four, if one other, if one person responds by saying Yarhamakallah, then this is fard al kifaya. He has met the duty, the obligation for the group, and there is no sin uh, for uh, 
not responding to the haq of their brother. Because we remember in the first hadith we talk about al uh, haq al-Muslim al-Muslim sit. You know, we mentioned the hadith where the Prophet wasallam said the right of a Muslim over his Muslim brother is six. So, this is from one of the rights, is that when he sneezes and says, Alhamdulillah, that you say, Ya Rahmakallah. So this is from one of the rights. So that right is fulfilled if one person uh, says, Ya Rahmakallah, from amongst that group. That's one goal, one view of the ulama. The other view, uh, uh, another group of scholars held the view that this is fard al ayn, meaning every individual who hears him say, uh, you know, every Muslim individual that hears him say Alhamdulillah after sneezing, that they should respond with Yarhamakallah. So this, I hope this is clear to, to have an understanding of the aqwal of the ulama in regards to this mas'ala. Uh, another uh, benefit of this hadith is that it is an obligation upon the one who sneezes Uh, that after someone has uh, said Ya Rahmakallah, that they respond. So that they, they respond, and they respond with Yahdikum Allah wa yuslih balakum. Uh, may Allah guide you and rectify your affairs. And so this is the appropriate response, and as we mentioned, uh, that uh, he mentions that this is a, an, ob, an obligation upon the one who sneezed. That if the person has responded with them, Yarahamakallah, then they should respond, Yahdikum Allah wa Yuslih Ba'alakum. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is also we see from this hadith that whoever. Uh, does an act of ibadah that they should strive their utmost to fulfill it by every wasila, every means that is lawful. That they should try their best to, to perfect that ibadah and fulfill it uh, accordingly. Another benefit of this hadith is that the one who sneezes uh, that they should uh, respond, as we mentioned, with Yahdikum Allah wa Yuslih Ba'alakum at the, uh, the end of the exchange, that they should do this in fulfillment of following the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. In the next hadith, Also a hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, None of you should drink standing. Ru'ahu uh, Muslim. This is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. This hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also illustrating, and that's why it's in the Kitab al-Adab, <coughs> also illustrating important manners to observe. And we know that they're important because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned them. If they had no importance, we would probably not even consider a lot of these or some of these as uh, adab, especially since we come from so many various cultures and backgrounds that maybe do not recognize these hakuk, some of these rights, and some of these uh, uh, Islamic manners. So that's why we know they are Islamic adab, because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw that it was fit and through his wahi uh, articulated these uh, manners for us to follow. And from those manners is that when a person uh, uh, drinks, that they should drink sitting. They should drink sitting. And now we're going to talk about uh, this, uh, the hukum and the, you know, the, the ruling and some of the uh, fawaid or benefits pertinent to this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Uh, so we see that a person, as is mentioned, 
as is mentioned in this hadith, that a person uh, should drink uh, while, they're, while they're sitting. Because the Prophet وسلم, said, لا يشربن. And here, this nahi mu'akkida bi noon tawkid. So here we have a noon, uh, and this has is, is pertinent to the Arabic grammar, uh, which is uh, there on the end of the word, which emphasizes the uh, prohibition. And because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said La, so he said no, or he said do not. So this shows us this is in the Sigha to Nahi. This is in the uh, way of uh, a prohibition. And so the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited drinking uh, while standing. So as we've talked about many times prior to this, that uh, two uh, rulings that are observed uh, that are that uh, that the scholars of fiqh mention uh, in in usul of fiqh that al amr yufid al wujub wa nahi yufid al tahrim that when there's a commandment in the shar that the asal of that the origin of that command is that it means that it's an obligation to fulfill that act. And that when there's a nahi, when there's a prohibition, that the asl of that prohibition is that this is something muharram, this is something a uh, haram to do, that you cannot do it. And since we have in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يشربن, do not drink, and then he mentioned qa'iman, he, uh, he mentioned standing, then this shows us that this is a prohibition, Muharram. However, and as we've mentioned prior to this as well, because we have other evidence from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to show that under some uh, situations it's permissible, then this takes that Nahi from being a, uh, from Tahrim to Nahi Likarahiya. And uh, what, so what we have from the evidence of the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is that we have examples in hadith literature for example in, uh, in Sahih Muslim we have a hadith that mentions that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam uh, that he, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, uh, that he drank also, uh, he, uh, on one occasion he drank zemzem and he was standing. So that's one uh, evidence to show that that nahi is not li tahrim. It is not for a prohibition, but rather it is li karahiyah that it is disliked to do so. So meaning that it's not sinful that you drink standing if there is a, you know, if you have a hajj, if you have some sort of need to do so. And the message, and, and that is shown from the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he drank some zemzem and he was standing. And there is no evidence to show that that was restricted specifically to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We also have other evidence that the Prophet sallallahu got up in the in in the from from the from the night from sleeping, and he took a spoon or a utensil uh, and drank from it while he was standing. And this is why you have a bab or a kitab in Sahih Muslim in which the first, uh, the hadith we mentioned about the Zamzam, and Imam Muslim, uh, it is entitled, Kitab al-Ashraba, Bab Karahiya to Sharab Qa'iman. That it is entitled, uh, the chapter of the dislike for drinking Standing. 
So Imam Muslim is showing that hukum uh, and his view regarding that, that this is something which is disliked because there are other ev there are evidence to show that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did it on some occasions. So that lets us know that it is not, he would not do it Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of course, if it was impermissible. And so that's how we see, and that gives us a, uh, how we should uh, understand the evidence from the Shara and the Munakisha uh, and, and the discourse around some of these ahkam and the discourse of the scholars in regards to these masail and the various masail in the shara. What we learn from this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first is that the prohibition of drinking while standing and that it is um, uh, disliked. And we talked a little bit about, and we discussed a little bit uh, about this. Uh, right, another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that also that the Sharia, that it is not restricted to only ibadat. Okay, and so this hadith is one of those hadith, and that's a fa'idah we gain from this hadith, to let us know that the Sharia is not just restricted to just acts of what we refer to as worship, but rather it, it, ref, it refers and governs all of our lives in so many, in so many ways, even as a Yahud had asked about the completion of Islam, and I believe it was Umar bin al-Khattab and he said, even our messenger, our, our, our Prophet وسلم, even taught us about, you know, manners, akramakum Allah, of using the restroom. That, you know, the shar' covers everything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِي كِتَابِ الْكِرِيمِ وَأَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِي كِتَابِ الْكِرِيمِ And we have revealed upon you the book, clarifying everything. Or, you know, or as a clarity for everything, or clarifying everything that this book was revealed meaning the Quran as a, a revelation to clarify things for us to clarify and 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 show us how we should uh, practice and live our lives and the Islamic adab and manners even associated with it and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the Shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.